Hi, my name is David Fraser. I'm a privacy, internet, and technology lawyer with the Canadian law firm McGinnis Cooper. I also teach internet and media law at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. Well, it's finally here, the long-anticipated online harms bill. It was tabled in Parliament on February 26, 2024 as Bill C-63. And it's not as bad as I expected, but it does have some serious issues that need to be addressed if it is ultimately going to be charter compliant. It also has some room for serious improvement, and it represents a real missed opportunity in how it handles deep fakes or synthetic explicit images and videos. The bill is a whopping 104 pages long, and it was just released, so of course this will just be a high-level overview and perhaps incomplete. But I will focus on some issues that leapt out to me on my first few times reading it. In a nutshell, the bill does a better job than the discussion paper first floated years ago by not lumping all kinds of online harms into one bucket and treating them all the same. This bill more acutely addresses child abuse materials and the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. I think the thresholds for some of these are far too low, resulting in removal by default. The new Digital Safety Commission has stunning and likely unconstitutional powers. And as is often the case, there's too much left to the regulations. But let's get into the substance. First, who does this apply to? It applies to social media companies that meet a particular threshold that is set in the regulation. Social media companies are defined as a website or application that is accessible in Canada, the primary purpose of which is to facilitate interprovincial or international online communication among users of the website or application by enabling them to access and share content. It also specifically includes an adult content service, namely a social media service that is focused on enabling its users to access and share pornographic content, and a live streaming service, namely a social media service that is focused on enabling its users to access and share content by live stream. This seems intended to capture sites like Pornhub and OnlyFans, but I think that there could be some arguments that might be made to say that they don't fit exactly within that definition. It specifically excludes services that do not permit a user to communicate to the public and carves out private messaging features. So instead of going after a very long list of communication service providers, this bill is much more focused, but it could also be tailored by the minister by regulation. So if Pornhub and OnlyFans are missed, they can be looped back in by regs. The Online News Act also creates a whole new regulatory bureaucracy, which includes the Digital Safety Commission, the Digital Safety Ombudsperson, and the Digital Safety Office. The Commission is essentially the regulator under this legislation, and I'll talk about them a bit more later. The Ombudsperson is more of an advocate for members of the public, and the Digital Safety Office is the bureaucracy that supports them both. As an aside, why call the bill the Online Harms Act, but call the Commission the Online Safety Commission? We have a Privacy Act and a Privacy Commissioner. We have a Competition Act and a Competition Commissioner. We have a Human Rights Act and a Human Rights Commission. In this bill, it's just not elegant. The legislation will impose a duty to act responsibly with respect to harmful content by implementing processes and mitigation measures that have to be approved by the Digital Safety Commissioner of Canada. Now, this is extremely open-ended, and there's no guarantee or assurance that this will be compatible with the digital safety schemes that these companies would be setting up in order to comply with the laws of other jurisdictions. We always need to be very careful that Made in Canada solutions don't result in requirements that are disproportionately burdensome in light of our market size. The large social media companies that immediately come to mind already have very robust digital safety policies and practices. So whatever is dictated by the Digital Safety Commissioner should be based on existing best practices, perhaps improving them, but not trying to reinvent the wheel. If you are a large social media company, you likely are looking to comply with the laws of every jurisdiction where you're active. Canada is but a drop in the internet bucket, and work done by organizations to comply with European requirements, for example, should be good enough for Canada. And if the cost of compliance is too onerous, service providers will look to avoid Canada, or they'll adopt policies of just removing everything that anyone objects to. And social media companies will be required to pay for the new digital bureaucracy, so that adds significantly to their cost of doing business in Canada. In addition to having to have government-approved policies, the bill does include some mandatory elements like the ability of users to block other users and flag harmful content. They also have to make a resource person available to users to hear concerns, direct them to resources, and provide guidance on the use of those resources. One thing that I was blown away by 
it's largely hidden in section 65. Now, this section reads, an operator must integrate into a regulated service that it operates any design features respecting the protection of children, such as age-appropriate design, that are provided for by regulations. Now, I was blown away by this for a couple reasons. The first is that it gives the government the power to dictate potentially huge changes or mandatory elements of an online service. They can do this by simple regulation. Protecting children is an ostensible motive, but is often a pretext for a huge range of legislative and regulatory actions, many of which tend to overreach. The second reason why I was blown away by this was it could amount to an age-appropriate design code via regulation. In the UK, the Information Commissioner's Office carried out massive amounts of consultation, research, and discussion before developing the UK's age-appropriate design code. In this case, the government can do this with a simple publication in the Canada Gazette. A lot of this bill turns on what is harmful content. It's defined in the legislation as seven different categories of content, each of which has its own specific definition. They are A, intimate content communicated without consent. B, content that sexually victimizes a child or re-victimizes a survivor. C, content that induces a child to harm themselves. D, content that is used to bully a child. E, content that foments hatred. F, content that incites violence and G, content that incites violent extremism or terrorism. Importantly, the bill treats the first two types of harmful content as distinct from the rest. This actually makes a lot of sense. Child sexual abuse materials are already illegal in Canada, and it's generally easy to identify. I'm not aware of any social media service that will abide by that sort of content on its platform even for a second. The category of content called intimate content communicated without consent is intended to capture what is already illegal in the criminal code related to the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. The definition in the online harms bill expands on that to incorporate what are commonly called deepfakes. These are images depicting a person in an explicit manner that's either a modification of existing photographs or videos or are completely synthetic as a result of someone's imagination or with the use of artificial intelligence. Now, I 100% support including deep fake explicit imagery in this bill, and I would also 100% support including it in the criminal code given the significant harm that it can cause to victims, but only if the definition is properly tailored. In the online harms bill, the definition is actually problematic and potentially includes any explicit or sexual image. Here's the definition, and note the use of the term reasonable to suspect. So this is from the definition. Intimate content communicated without consent means A, a visual recording, such as a photographic film or video recording, in which a person is nude or is exposing their sexual organs or anal region, or is engaged in explicit sexual activity, if it is reasonable to suspect, suspect. One, the person had a reasonable expectation of privacy at the time of the recording. And two, the person does not consent to the recording being communicated. And B, a visual recording, such as a photographic film or video recording, that falsely presents, in a reasonably convincing manner, a person as being nude or exposing their sexual organs or anal region, or engaging in explicit sexual activity, including a deepfake, that presents a person in that manner, if it's reasonable to suspect, suspect that the person does not consent to the recording being communicated. So what's the problem? The problem is that the wording reasonable grounds to suspect cannot be found in the criminal code definition for this type of content. And there's a very good reason for that. Either content is consensual or it is not. In the criminal code at section 162.1, it defines intimate image to mean a visual recording of a person made by any means, including photographic, film, or video recording, A, in which the person is nude, is exposing his or her genital organs or anal region or her breasts, or is engaged in explicit sexual activity, B, in respect of which, at the time of the recording, there were circumstances that gave rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy, and C, in respect of which the person depicted retains a reasonable expectation of privacy at the time the offense is committed. In the criminal code, either there is consent or, is, or there is not. In this bill, the threshold is the dramatically low reasonable to suspect standard. All you need is a reasonable suspicion, and it's not just with respect to the circumstances at the time the image was taken or created, assuming we're dealing with an actual person and an actual image. You can be 85% confident that it's consensual, but that remaining 15% results in a reasonable suspicion that it's not. 
When you're dealing with the section related to purported deepfakes, it does not specify that the image has to be of an actual person, whether synthetic or not. It could, in fact, be a completely fictional person that has been created using Photoshop or some other software. That would cause no risk of harm to anyone. Given that the image is artificial and the circumstances of its creation are completely unknown, as is the person supposedly depicted in it, you can't help but have a reasonable ground to suspect that it might have been communicated non-consensually. Deepfakes of actual people created using artificial intelligence is a real thing and a real problem. But artificial intelligence is actually even better at creating images and videos of fake people. You should not be surprised that it's being used by people to create erotic or sexual content of AI-generated people. While this may not be your cup of tea, it's completely lawful. And it actually gets even worse because with respect to deepfakes, the Online Harms Act turns on whether the actual communication itself may have been without consent, not the creation of the image. Setting aside for a moment that a fictional person can never consent and can never even withhold consent, an example immediately comes to mind drawn directly from Canada's history of bad legislation related to technology and online mischief. People may recall that a number of years ago, Nova Scotia passed a law called the Cyber Safety Act, which was intended to address online bullying. It was so poorly drafted and so broad that it was ultimately found to be unconstitutional and thrown out. During the time when that law was actually in force, we had an incident in Nova Scotia where two young people discovered that their local member of the legislature had previously had a career as an actor. As part of that career, she appeared in a cable television series. It was actually quite popular. And at least in a number of scenes, she appeared naked or semi-nude. These foolish young men decided to take a picture from the internet, and there were hundreds of them to choose from, and tweeted it. So what happened next? This politician got very mad and she contacted the Nova Scotia cyber cops who threatened the young man with all sorts of significant consequences. That particular image was taken in a Hollywood studio, presumably after the actor had signed the usual releases. But that would potentially fit into this category of harmful content if it were tweeted after the Online Harms Act comes into effect because someone reviewing it on behalf of a platform after it had been flagged would have no idea where the image came from. And if anyone says or flags it as non-consensual, that's probably enough to create a reasonable suspicion. And at least in one scene that this actor, now politician, appeared, it actually looks like it was taken with a hidden camera. Now, surely it cannot be the intention of the Minister of Justice to regulate that sort of thing. In some ways, it doesn't matter because it would be likely found to be a violation of our freedom of expression right under Section 2B of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I don't think that infringement could be justified under Section 1 of the Charter. But wait, it gets even worse. With respect to the two special categories of harmful content, operators of social media services have an obligation to put in place a flagging mechanism so that objectionable content can be flagged by users. If there are reasonable grounds to believe that the content that has been flagged fits into one of those two categories, they must remove it. Reasonable grounds to believe is a very low standard. Not as low as suspicion, but pretty low. But when you combine the two, the standard is so low that it's in the basement. Reasonable grounds to believe that there are reasonable grounds to suspect is such a low standard that it's probably unintelligible. Now, don't get me wrong, deep fakes are a real, real problem. When a sexually explicit but synthetic image of a real person is created, it has significant impacts on the victim. If they were doing anything other than window dressing, they would have paid very close attention to this critical definition and how it's handled. But they've created a scheme in which anything that is explicit could fit into this category by anybody, rendering the whole thing liable to be thrown out as a violation of the Charter, thereby further victimizing vulnerable victims. It actually gets even worse because the Digital Safety Commissioner can get involved and they can order the removal of contents. The removal of content is again based on simple, reasonable grounds to believe that the material is within that category, which again only requires a reasonable ground to suspect a lack of consent. So the Commission is a government actor ordering the removal of expressive content that unquestionably engages the freedom of expression right in our Charter. Where you have a definition that's so broad that it can include content that does not pose any risk of harm to any individual, that definition cannot be upheld as Charter compliant. So let's talk briefly about the mechanics of flagging. So if a user flags content as either sexually victimizing a child or as intimate content communicated without consent, the operator has to review it within 24 hours. The operator can only dismiss the flag if it's trivial, frivolous, vexatious, or made in bad faith, or if that content has already been dealt with. 
If it's not dismissed, they must block it immediately and make it inaccessible to people in Canada. If they block it, which is clearly the default, they have to give notice to the person who posted it and to the flagger. And they have to give them an opportunity to make representations. What the timeline is for this will be in the regulations. But based on those representations, the operator must then decide whether there are reasonable grounds to believe the content is that type of harmful content. And if so, then they have to make it accessible to persons in Canada. Section 64 sub 4 says they'd have to continue to make it inaccessible to all persons in Canada, which suggests that they have to have a mechanism to make sure it's not reposted. Now, there is a reconsideration process within the operator, which is largely a repeat of the original flag and review process. One thing that I find puzzling is that this mechanism is mandatory and does not seem to permit the platform operator from doing their usual thing, which is to review material posted on their platform and simply removing it if they are of the view that it violates their platform policies. If it is clearly imagery that depicts child sexual abuse, they should be able to remove it without notice and without involving the original poster. Each regulated operator has to submit a digital safety plan to the Digital Safety Commissioner. The contents of this are enormous. It's a full report on everything the operator does to comply with the Act, and also includes information on all the measures that they use to protect children, preventing harmful content, have to provide statistics about flags and takedown broken down by category of content, the resources they allocate to comply, and information respecting content other than harmful content that was moderated by the operator and that the operator had reasonable grounds to believe posed a risk of significant psychological or physical harm. But that's not all. It also includes information about complaints, concerns heard, and any research the operator has done related to safety on their platform. And of course, any other information provided for by regulations. And most of this has to be published on the operator's platform. The Commission can also accredit people other than individuals to access electronic data in the digital safety plans. These people must be conducting research, education, advocacy, or awareness activities related to the purposes of the Act. The Commission can grant access to these inventories and suspend or revoke accreditation if the person doesn't comply with the conditions. Accredited people can also request access to electronic data in digital safety plans from regulated service operators, and the Commission can order that the operator provide the data. However, this access is only allowed for research projects related to the Act's purposes. The only say that an operator of a regulated service has by this is that they can request that the Commission change or cancel the order providing access to those records. The Commission can do so if they find, according to the criteria in the regulations, that the operator can't comply with the order or that doing so would cause the operator undue hardship. An accredited person who requested an order may complain to the Commission if the operator subject to the order fails to comply. The Commission must give the operator a chance to make representations in that case. Finally, the Commission may publish a list of accredited people and a description of the research projects for which the Commission has made such an order. So let's talk about submissions from the public and complaints to the Commission. The Act contains a mechanism by which any person in Canada may make submissions to the Commission respecting harmful content that is accessible on a regulated service or the measures taken by the operator of a regulated service to comply with the operator's duties under the Act. The Commission can provide information about the submission to the relevant operator, and there are particular provisions to protect the identity of any employees of an operator who may make a submission to the Commission. The real enforcement powers of the Commission come into play in Part 6 of the Act. Any person in Canada may make a complaint to the Commission that content on a regulated service is either content that sexually victimizes a child, or re-victimizes a survivor, or is intimate content communicated without consent. These are the particularly acute categories of deemed harmful content. The Commission has to conduct an initial assessment of the complaint and does have to dismiss it if the Commission is of the opinion that it's trivial, frivolous, or vexatious, or made in bad faith, or it's otherwise been dealt with. But if the complaint is not dismissed, the Commission must, not may, but must give notice of the complaint to the operator and must make an order requiring the operator to, without delay, make the content inaccessible to all persons in Canada and to continue to make it inaccessible, so block it, until the Commission gives notice to the operator of its final decision. This is an immediate takedown order without any substantial consideration of the merits of the complaint. All they need is a non-trivial complaint. Now, I don't mind the immediate takedown if one reasonably suspects the content is child sexual abuse material, but the categories are actually much broader than that. The operator must ask the user who posted the content on the service whether they consent to their contact information being provided to the Commission. If the user consents, the operator must provide the contact information to the Commission. 
It's a conversation largely like, hey, you're being accused of posting illegal content on the internet. Do you want us to give your contact information to the Canadian government? I'm not sure how that's going to go. But so the commission must give the complainant and the user who communicated the content on the service, so the poster, an opportunity to make representations as to whether the content is content that fits into those categories of harmful content. Now this is where the rubber really hits the road. The commission must decide whether there are reasonable grounds to believe that the content fits into those categories. In a criminal court, the court would have to consider on evidence whether the content fits the definition beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil court, the court would have to consider whether the content fits the definition but on a balance of probabilities using admissible evidence. Here, all the commission needs to conclude is whether there are reasonable grounds to believe if they do, they issue an order that it be made permanently inaccessible to all persons in Canada. That's a dramatically low bar for permanent removal. And again, I'm not concerned about it being used when the material is child sexual abuse imagery, or it's even reasonably suspected to be that. But there's a very strong likelihood that this will capture content that really is not internet intimate content communicated without consent. Recall the definition and the use of reasonable to suspect. So again, to order a permanent takedown of content, the commission just needs to conclude that there are reasonable grounds to believe that it has reasonable grounds to suspect a lack of consent. There's no requirement for the complainant to say, hey, that's me and I didn't consent to that. So unless you know the full context and background of the image or video, and know positively that there was consent, there will almost always be grounds to suspect that there wasn't. And remember that the deep fake provision doesn't specifically require that it be an actual living person depicted. It could be a complete figment of a computer's imagination, which is otherwise entirely lawful under Canadian law, but it could still be ordered to be taken down. In addition, the Commission has vast, vast powers. They're breathtaking, actually. These are set out in Part 7 of the Act, and here's part of these powers. It says in Section 86, in ensuring an operator's compliance with this Act, or investigating a complaint made under Subsection 81 Sub 1, the Commission may, in accordance with any rules made under Subsection 20 Sub 1, a. Summon and enforce the appearance of persons before the Commission and compel them to give oral or written evidence on oath and to produce any documents or other things that the Commission considers necessary in the same manner and to the same extent as a Superior Court of Record. B. Administer oaths. C. Receive and accept any evidence or other information, whether on oath, by affidavit or otherwise, that the Commission sees fit, whether or not it would be admissible in a court of law. And D. Decide any procedural or evidentiary question. And check out these rules of evidence or absence of rules of evidence for the Commission. This is from Section 87, which says, The Commission is not bound by any legal or technical rules of evidence. It must deal with all matters that come before it as informally and expeditiously as the circumstances and considerations of fairness and natural justice permit. If the Commission holds a hearing, which is entirely within its discretion to determine when a hearing is appropriate, it must be held in public unless it isn't. There's a laundry list of reasons why it can decide to close all or part of a hearing to the public. Many of them make a lot of sense. But I don't expect we'll see many hearings for individual complaints. Now, the next part is staggering. In Section 90, the Commission can designate inspectors who get a certificate of designation, and their powers are set out in Section 91. So without a warrant and without notice, an inspector can enter any place in which they have reasonable grounds to believe that there is any document, information, or other thing relevant to that purpose. Once they're in the business, once they're on the property, they can examine any document or information that's found in the place, copy it in whole or in part, and take it for examination or copying. Examine any other thing that's found in the place and take it for examination. Use or cause to be used any computer system at the place to examine any document or information that is found in the place. D, reproduce any document or information or cause it to be re reproduced and take it for examination or copying. E, use or cause to be used any copying equipment or means of telecommunication at the place to make copies of or transmit any document or information. They can also force any person at that place to assist them and to provide documents, information, and any other thing. 
And they can bring anybody else with them who they think is necessary to help them exercise their powers or perform their duties or functions. There's also a standalone requirement to provide information or access to an inspector. Section 93 says an inspector may, for a purpose related to verifying compliance or preventing non-compliance with this act, require any person who is in possession of a document or information that the inspector considers necessary for that purpose to provide the document or information to the inspector or provide the inspector with access to the document or information in the form and manner and within the time specified by the inspector. Let's pause for a moment. So imagine a scenario in which, let's say, I am advising a social media company. I am providing them with legal advice. I may be and may have in my legal file information that would be of interest to an inspector. This seems to suggest, particularly where the commission can receive evidence without regard to any rules of evidence, that they might in fact try to get information that's subject to privilege. Holy crap. And again, no court order, no warrant, no limit, no oversight. It's also worth noting that I have in the past had the privacy commissioners, investigators, trying to get access to my legal file. So this is not without precedent. That was, of course, slapped down by a court, but why not spell it out? It's worth noting that most social media companies don't operate out of Canada. And international law would prevent an inspector from, for example, going to California and inspecting the premises of a company there. The Act grants the Commission staggeringly broad powers to issue compliance orders. And all these orders need, again, is reasonable grounds to believe. And there's no opportunity for an operator to hear the concerns, make submissions to the Commission, and have the Commission respond. And what can be ordered is virtually unlimited. There's no due process, no oversight, no appeal of the order, and the penalty for contravening such an order is enormous. It's up to the greater of $25 million or 8% of the operator's global revenue. If you use Facebook's 2023 global revenue, that ceiling is 15 billion Canadian dollars. So take a look at section 94 sub one. If the commission has reasonable grounds to believe that an operator is contravening or has contravened this act, it may make an order requiring the operator to take or refrain from taking any measure to ensure compliance with this act. This is ultimately a breathtaking power without due process, without a hearing, without evidence, and only on a reasonable grounds to believe. And what can be ordered is massively open-ended. There isn't a requirement to hold a hearing. There isn't a requirement that these orders can only be made after a hearing takes place. You may note that Section 124 of the Act says that nobody can be imprisoned in default of payment for a fine under the Act. Which, you know, these aren't prison-worthy things, I would think, but... The reason for this is actually to avoid due process. Under our laws, and particularly under the Charter, if there's a possibility of imprisonment, there's a requirement for higher due process and procedural fairness. So it's an explicit decision made, in my view, by the government to get away with a lower level of due process. The Act makes the regulated operators pay to fund the costs of the Digital Safety Commission Ombudsperson and Office. Certainly, it has some good optics that the cost of this new bureaucracy will not be paid from the public purse, but I expect that any regulated operator will be doing some math. If the cost of compliance and the cost of this digital safety tax is sufficiently large, they may think again about whether to continue to provide services in Canada. We saw that with the Online News Act that Meta decided the cost of carrying links to news was greater than the benefit they obtained by doing so. And then they rationally decided to no longer permit news links in Canada. And there you go. Finally, the Act also includes significant amendments to the Criminal Code and the Human Rights Act. And I agree with other commentators in reaching the conclusion that bolting on these amendments was a huge mistake. And I think doing so will actually imperil any meaningful discussion about online safety. Once again, the government royally screwed up by including too much in the bill. So the bill makes significant additions to the criminal code. Hate propaganda offenses carry, carry harsher penalties. The bill defines hatred in line with Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence and creates a new hate crime, an offense motivated by hatred. Moreover, the act amends the Canadian Human Rights Act, and it adds communication of hate speech through the internet or similar channels as a discriminatory practice. These amendments give individuals the right to file complaints with the Human Rights Commission, which in turn can impose penalties of up to $20,000. However, these changes concern user-to-user -user communication, not social media platforms or broadcast undertakings or telecommunication service providers. 
The bill also further introduces amendments related to the mandatory reporting of child sexual abuse materials. They clarify the definition of internet service to include access hosting and interpersonal communication like email. And any person providing an internet service to the public must send all notifications related to child sexual abuse materials to a designated law enforcement body. And it also has alterations to the preservation period for data related to an offense. All in all, it's not as bad as I expected it would be, but it is not without its serious issues. Given that the discussion paper from a number of years ago was a potential disaster, and much of that has been approved by the consultation process, I have some hope that the government will listen to those who want to, in good faith, improve this bill. That may be a faint hope, but unless it's improved, it will likely be substantially struck down as unconstitutional, in my opinion. I hope this has been interesting and useful. I try to put out a new video every few weeks, so if you're interested in this sort of content, please click the like and subscribe buttons. Also leave a comment if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for other topics to cover. And of course, feel free to share this with anyone who you think may be interested in hearing about Canadian tech and privacy law. Thanks for tuning in.